Before we get started, we're so close to hitting 100,000 subscribers, so it would mean a lot to me if you could hit that subscribe button. With that, let's get to the video. This is the story of Air India Express Flight 1344. On the 7th of August 2020, a Boeing 737 was making its way from Dubai to Calicut with 190 people on board. As the 737-800 approached Calicut, the monsoon was in full swing across the entire area. The pilots got their list of diversion airports through the ACARS. Landing at Calicut was a challenge in the best of times. The airfield is elevated above the surrounding terrain, thus you have big drops on both ends of the runway. Landing at Calicut was so challenging that only captains were allowed to attempt landings there. The weather at Calicut was quite bad. But the weather at Cochin and Coimbatore were much better, so if needed, they could divert there. At 1.19 p.m. UTC, Chennai Upper Area Control got in contact with Flight 1344, letting them know of the conditions at Calicut. The runway in use was runway 28, and the visibility was at 1,500 meters. The winds were a bit concerning at 14 knots. As Flight 1344 descended, it was handed over to Cochin Lower Area Control, and finally, by the time it was at 12,000 feet, it was in contact with Calicut ATC. At this point, Flight 1344 was 52 nautical miles away, and the airport was experiencing some mild rain. Speaking of the airport, the airport had two active warnings at that time. One was for the thunderstorm, and the second one was for the wind, which was now at 17 knots. This meant that the crash fire tenders were already at their predetermined positions, just in case of an emergency. As Flight 1344 approached the airport, it was cleared to descend to 3,600. As the plane lined up with the runway, the weather seemed to ease up. The visibility was at 2,000 meters, and the winds had come down to 5 knots. But they were having trouble with the windshield wipers on the captain's side. The wiper would work for a bit, and then it would stop. The captain remarked, Wiper is gone. What a day for the wiper to go. But they carried on with their landing attempt on runway 28. The plane descended, but they couldn't see the runway. Eventually, they hit their minimum descent altitude, and without the runway in sight, they decided to go around. As Flight 1344 flew away from the airport, the gear and flaps were retracted, and the pilots reprogrammed the flight management computer for attempt number two. But on the ground, Air India Flight 425 was getting ready to depart to New Delhi. They wanted to take off from runway 10 due to the winds at the time. ATC asked Flight 1344 if they'd like to use runway 10 for their next landing attempt. The pilots of Flight 1344 checked the winds and the visibility for runway 10 a few times, and eventually they accepted. At 1.59 p.m. and 42 seconds UTC, Flight 1344 was cleared to descend from 7,000 feet. They were cleared for the ILS Zulu approach to runway 10. As they headed away from the airport, Air India Flight 425 took off from runway 10. They reported winds of up to 10 knots. By 2.06 p.m. UTC, the plane was turning inbound, intercepting the localizer of runway 10. The crew were again fiddling with the windshield wiper. The windshield wiper worked, but it wasn't fast as they wanted it to be. But soon after that, the plane intercepted the glide slope and began the descent to runway 10. The crew at this point carried out the landing checklist. In a matter of minutes, the 737 was just 500 feet above the ground. The captain disengaged the autopilot and took manual control of the plane. When he did this, the rate of descent began to increase. The first officer cautioned the captain about the high rate of descent which momentarily reached 1,500 feet per minute. The approach was beginning to unravel. They were 1.7 dots below the glide slope. Signifying that, the automated glide slope warning filled the cockpit. The captain arrested their descent, at least for a bit. He pulled back, reducing the rate of descent to 300 feet per minute. But soon, the rate of descent was back at 1,000 feet per minute. Flight 1344 passed the threshold of runway 10, at 92 feet. As the 737 flew over the runway, the captain added a bit more power to slow the plane's descent. They had gone through 1,300 feet of runway, and the plane was still 20 feet off the ground. When the plane was 3,000 feet down the runway, it still hadn't touched down. 
The first officer expressed some concern, saying, Just check it. The plane was still not down. The plane was eating up valuable runway as it floated along. The first officer said, Captain, in an uneasy tone. At this point, the plane was 3,600 feet from the threshold of runway 10, and it still had not touched down. The first officer was very concerned, and he called for a go round. But the captain did not acknowledge the call for the go round. 4,400 feet down the 8,800 foot long runway, the plane finally touched down. The captain immediately overrode the systems and commanded maximum braking. Within seconds, the plane was nearing the end of the runway. The end of the paved runway and safety area loomed in front of them. The airplane soon left the paved runway and dug itself into soft mud, which slowed it down a bit, but it wasn't enough. Flight 1344 overshot the runway at 84 knots and fell 110 feet. 21 people did not make it. When a plane overshoots a runway, there's so much that could have gone wrong. The plane could have been too heavy, one of the deceleration devices could have failed, and the runway could have been too slippery. In the case of Flight 1344, the data showed that the plane was in great shape and it was working as intended, aside from the windshield wiper, that is. The brakes were also fine. They were able to ascertain that the tires did not lock up. They were spinning, which meant that the plane was under control throughout the landing. Since it was wet, hydroplaning was on the investigators' minds, but they found no signs of hydroplaning on the tires themselves or on the runway. Their attention then turned to the runway itself. The entire length of the runway is 2,860 meters or 9,300 feet. But not all of that runway is used for landing. You see, after the crash of Air India Express Flight 812, there was a directive asking airports to provide runway and safety areas of at least 240 meters. Instead of lengthening the runway at Calicut, they shrunk the available landing distance. The last bit of runway was there just in case an airplane overran the runway. So when you did your landing calculations, the available length of runway was listed as 2,700 meters or 8,800 feet, which is more than what a 737 needs to land. The investigators also measured the friction on the runway. It was well within limits. Flight 1344 should have been able to stop on this runway. To understand Flight 1344, we need to go back before the plane even got near Calicut. When the plane started its descent, the pilots knew that the monsoon was in full swing. On the CVR, the investigators could hear that the pilots carried out the approach briefing, but they skipped over some very important things. The pilots did not do the available landing distance calculations. This is very important for a landing, especially at an airport like Calicut, with so many constraints. Shockingly, they found out that this practice was common at the airline. Also, they did not prepare for a potential runway change. They were setting things up to go wrong. The first approach was uneventful. They were using the ILS, and this is when the windshield wiper started to give them trouble. Since they couldn't see the runway due to the weather, they went around. Then, as they flew away from the airport, the runway in use changed from runway 28 to runway 10. Now, they had to program and prep an entirely new approach. The workload in the cockpit grew. As they set up the approach to runway 10, the plane flew out into the dark Arabian Sea. When you're landing on a new runway, you have to redo a lot of briefings, but those briefings were not done in a satisfactory manner. For example, they did not do a landing distance calculation. Quote, the pilots omitted to make the necessary calculation for ALD, resulting in a serious and critical lapse. End quote. Also, when they agreed to land on runway 10, they did not consider the fact that they'd be landing with a significant tailwind component. This would just add to the distance that they needed to stop. With this, we get into the final phase of the approach. As the plane descended, it was hit by 13 knot crosswinds. Then, as we discussed before, the autopilot was disengaged and the plane goes below the glide slope and the captain tries to correct it. At this point, the approach is no longer stabilized. They should go around, but they don't. When flight 1344 gets to the runway, it passes the point where they should touch down, but it didn't touch down there. It touched down halfway down the runway, which was way too late. The first officer called for a go around. He knew that this attempt needed to be abandoned, but his go around call did not get a response. Now the question becomes 
Why did the plane touch down so far down the runway? The captain knew the airport well. He had flown into Calicut a lot. After the first go-around, these pilots were stressed. The unplanned change of runway was taxing them a lot. This is evident in the fact that they didn't even consider a diversion. This could be because of scheduling issues. The captain was on the roster for the next day on a flight from Calicut to Doha. There was no one else that could take his place. So if flight 1344 diverted, or if it was delayed, tomorrow's flight might have to be cancelled. This put even more stress on him. So as the approach progressed, their situational awareness began to fall apart. For example, when they landed, the pilots deployed the thrust reversers. Then, before they could kick in, the reversers were stowed. Then at the end, the reversers were deployed again. It was as if they couldn't make up their minds. Then, the environment that they were in contributed greatly to the late touchdown. It was a dark night, and the approach was made over the Arabian Sea. There were very few visual cues that one could use to orient themselves, making disorientation a big possibility. Making matters worse for the crew of Flight 1344, the wiper was slower than usual. This meant that the captain was looking at the runway lights through a wet windshield. This would have really messed with his depth perception. It would have been very hard for the captain to visually gauge their altitude in that situation. This definitely contributed to the late touchdown. In fact, the approach into Calicut has all the hallmarks of a visual illusion known as a black hole approach. In a black hole approach, the lack of lights around an airport can cause a pilot to make a shallow approach. The pilot just thinks that he's too high and then tries to correct for that. In the case of Flight 1344, due to the stress, the lack of planning, and the shallow approach, Flight 1344 touched down too far down the runway with not enough room to stop. There's so much more to cover with this crash. For example, the rescuers were not familiar with the 737-800. ATC was slow in disseminating information. The wind sensors at the airport were a bit wonky. But if we dove into all of that, we'd be here for hours. But I'd like to look at something different. For me at least, the parallels between Flight 1344 and Air India Flight 812 are too big to ignore. It's a saddening sense of deja vu. Think about it. Both planes were landing at airports with tabletop runways, which had gorges at the ends of the runways. Both planes were 737-800s. Both planes touched down way too late, and in both cases, the first officer made a call-out for a go-around, which were ignored. The similarities are eerie. It's like Flight 1344 is a haunting echo of Flight 812. One thing is clear, though. We still have a lot of work to do. The airport at Calicut used to handle wide bodies, everything from 747s to 777s to A330s, but of late that's been suspended due to safety concerns. Do you think that the airport should be allowed to handle wide bodies in the future? Let me know your opinions down below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.